Now to those new troubles for the host government at the Super Bowl, New Jersey's Chris Christie, confronting potentially explosive charges from a key witness that he wasn't telling the whole truth at that marathon press conference on the Bridgegate scandal. Christie pushing back hard overnight, and ABC's Rena Ninen has all the latest. Thousands of fans here in New York cheering their teams. But New Jersey Governor Chris Christie getting jeers from the crowd Saturday. Enough speeches of the same thing. I want to tell everybody out there. To After a potentially explosive claim from a former ally, former Port Authority official David Wildstein, who alleges Christie knew about those lane closures that brought traffic on the George Washington Bridge to a standstill in September. In a letter Friday, Wildstein's lawyer wrote, evidence exists tying Mr. Christie to having knowledge of the lane closures during the period when the lanes were closed. But Christie's office is fighting back, sending an email to supporters Saturday obtained by ABC News attacking Wildstein's background and credibility. The message concludes, David Wildstein will do and say anything to save David Wildstein. And the statement repeats Christie's claim that he had no involvement in the lane closures. I had no knowledge of this, of the planning, the execution or anything about it. Um, and then I first found out about it um, after it was over. But the investigation continues. On Monday, newly subpoenaed documents are expected to be turned over to the state legislative committee examining the traffic scandal. While Christie has not been subpoenaed, much like the final score of tonight's game, his political future is still unknown. For this week, Rena Nine and ABC News, New York. Thanks, Serena. Now let's bring in our headliner, top Republican congressman, former candidate for Vice President Paul Ryan. Thank you for joining us this morning, Congressman. Lots to talk about the fallout from the State of the Union, legislative battles ahead. But let's begin with these new charges against uh, Chris Christie. You see the Democrats already out with an online ad this morning. With all these investigations swirling around him, are you confident he can continue to run the Republicans' Governors Association and be an effective spokesman for your party? I am confident. I'm, I consider Chris Christie a friend. I think he's been a fantastic governor. Uh, right now, all we know is uh, one person's word against another. You can't base any conclusion on such a thing. And so unless something else is known or made clear, I don't see why you would change what, what's going on right now. I don't think you should step down because uh, nothing has been proven, and you always give a person the benefit of the doubt in those kinds of situations, in my judgment. Okay, let's turn to the president's State of the Union this week. Uh, he called for Congress to act, but also made it very clear that he would use executive orders to advance his agenda. Let's take a look. Wherever and whenever I can take steps without legislation to expand opportunity for more American families, that's what I'm going to do. Now, you've had a pretty tough reaction to this, suggesting the president is, quote, circumventing the Constitution. Do you really think his proposals are unconstitutional? You know, his rate of using executive orders is far behind President Reagan, President Bush, President Clinton. It's not the number of executive orders. It's the scope of the executive orders. It's the fact that he's actually contradicting law, like in the health care case, or proposing new laws without going through Congress, George. That's the issue. So you think so he's violating the Constitution? We have an increasingly lawless presidency. We have an increasingly lawless presidency where he is actually doing the job of Congress, writing new policies and new laws without going through Congress. Presidents don't write laws. Congress does. And when he does things like he did in health care, delaying mandates that the law said was supposed to occur when they were supposed to occur, that's not his job. The job of Congress is to change laws if he doesn't like them, not the presidency. Well, so if you... executive orders are one thing. But executive orders that actually change the statute, that's totally different. But if you think he's lawless, circumventing the Constitution, are you going to move to impeach? No, I'm... <laughs> look, what we, we have a difference of opinion, clearly. And, and some of these are going to get fought out on court. Uh, you have some court challenges with respect to religious freedom going to the court this spring. But I am concerned about this trend, such as what he said at the State of the Union, that if Congress doesn't give me the law I want, I'm going to go do it myself. That's effectively what he said. Uh, that is not the way our Constitution works. And by the way, when we get sworn in, whether it's a president or a congressman, you swear to uphold the Constitution. And I think these executive orders are creating a dangerous trend, which is uh, contrary to the Constitution. Listening to both you and President Obama, on the other hand, this week, it does sound like you could have a meeting of the minds uh, on immigration, reach a compromise on immigration reform, one that opens a path to citizenship for the undocumented, uh, but doesn't necessarily guarantee, not, not, doesn't necessarily have a special path for the undocumented. Uh, but this talk of compromise has unleashed a furious debate inside your own party. Uh, I want to show you what Bill Crystal wrote in the Weekly Standard 
this week. He said bringing immigration to the floor ensures a circular GOP firing squad instead of a nicely lined up one shooting together and in unison at Obamacare and other horrors of big government liberalism. Since there's really no need to act this year on immigration, don't don't even try your response. Well, look, we don't know who's coming and going in this country, George. We don't have control of our border. We don't have control of interior enforcement. You just talked about the Boston bombers. And so doing nothing on the security side of this, we think, is not a responsible thing to do. It's appropriate you brought this subject up after talking about these executive orders. Here's the issue that all Republicans agree on. We don't trust the president to enforce the law. So if you actually look at the standards that the Republican leadership put out, which is security first. First, we have to secure the border, have interior enforcement, which is a worker verification system, a visa tracking program. Those things have to be in law, in practice, and independently verified before the rest of the law can occur. So it's a security force first non-amnesty approach. The other concern that people have in our party is they don't want to see us get into conference with the Senate and then, and then compromise to a bad law. We won't let that happen because we've already said we won't go to the conference with the Senate. And so this is not one of those issues where it has some kind of a deadline behind it, like, say, a government shutdown, which forces us into a compromise we might not like to take. This is a, here are our standards, this is our approach. If you want to do it this way, this is what we're willing to do. And we're still having a debate in our caucus about even that. But we don't think that we can allow this border to continue to be overrun. And if we can get security first, no amnesty, before anything happens, we think that's a good approach. This bottom, is not a trust but verify. This is a verify then trust approach. Bottom line, can you put something on the president's desk this year that he can sign? I really don't know the answer to that question. I, I, that is clearly in doubt. It depends on whether they're willing to actually secure the border, actually have interior enforcement, and, not, and agree to not having an amnesty. If we can do that, where it's security first, no amnesty, then we might be able to get somewhere. But I, I just don't know if, they, if that's going to be the case or Let not. Let me also ask you about the debt limit. The president made it clear again this week that there's no way he's going to uh, agree to anything but a clean debt limit. That's the only thing he is going to sign. You and members of your caucus still talking about attaching some policy changes uh, to the debt limit. Is there any reason to think that can succeed? It hasn't before. Well, I think that we've had, well, we have had policies attached to the debt limit before. That's actually more ca the case than not. Usually, whatever, whoever a president is, whoever's running Congress, there is policy attached to the debt limit. So that's, that's not a new idea. What we don't like is this idea of continually rubber stamping debt limit increases without acknowledging the problem that got us into debt in the first place. The challenge we have is this president has never proposed to ever balance the budget, let alone pay off the debt. He's been fiscally reckless, in our opinion, and we think we should take some steps in the right direction. And the thing is, we know that there are Democrats who agree with us in the Senate. And so we'd like to, to look at what are those things we can do to take a step in the right direction with jobs, the economy, getting this deficit under control while we deal with the fact that our deficit's out of control. But as you know, the president's not going to sign that. I want to ask you a final question uh, about some recent comments you made about Pope Francis. You praised him for taking on the debate about poverty, but also seemed to dismiss his pretty piercing critique of capitalism, suggesting he really doesn't understand it. This is what you said to the Milwaukee Journal. The guy is from Argentina. They haven't had real capitalism in Argentina. Was that a little too flip? No, not at all. Uh, I think they have crony capitalism in Argentina where you have real exploitation. That is not the free market. That's crony capitalism. Um, we, we're starting to see some crony capitalism here in America. What, I, what I'm excited about the Pope's comments is he's inviting a debate. He's not settling the debate. He's inviting the debate. And he is asking lay Catholics to say how we would actually tackle these problems and bring the poor in, stop isolating the poor. These are good things. I think he's, he's starting a fantastic debate. And if you look at his comments very closely, he always talks about the welfare mentality. He always talks about the welfare state and how we have to avoid creating a welfare state. Bring the poor in, create upward mobility, and free enterprise that gives opportunity to everybody, no matter who they are and where they are in life and in America. That's what we're for. He's invited this debate, and I think it's a fantastic you, conversation. You don't think he'd endorse your budget, do you? Of course not. I don't think... He's a pope. Popes don't endorse budgets. <laughs> Popes say, let's have a conversation about how to fix the broken status quo, how to bring the poor in, how to not have a welfare state, and how to produce upward mobility. Popes don't in, in, in endorse actual legislative changes or budgets like that. Congressman, thanks for your time this morning. It's going to be an interesting debate. Thank you, George.